Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we can talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. Listening to Jams and Tea. Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today, we're coming at you with a new episode covering two new releases from 2021. We are going to be talking about Haley Williams, front woman of Paramore's new solo effort, Flowers for Vases, slash Spanish word that I did not bother to learn. Um, I and... looked up what it meant, and it's something you put on a grave. Sure. There we go. And we're going to be talking about Slow Tie, uh, his new record. Ty- is it Tyron? Tyrone? Tyron? Tyrone, I think. Yes. The new Slow Tie record. The new Slow Tie record. Slow and tie. What you mean later. And green light, Tim <laughs> Tim <laughs> sweep your chimneys. Oh, you sweep your chimneys. <laughs> Gonna start drinking uh, early today, I think. Oh. Yeah, start, start talking about Brockhampton early. But on today's yeah. Record Club episode, we are going to be talking about my recommended record this week, which is Brockhampton's Iridescence. And if you want to know more about Brockhampton, I have just released three videos this week covering the three albums that they released right before Iridescence, just to catch you up to speed mm-hmm. with what we are going to be talking about today. So go check those out, and you will be fully informed if you do not know already. And then the discussion may commence. They're very good videos. <clears throat> we kick off with their typical segment, which is what we've been listening to the past week. Mm. Uh, Jake, what have you been listening to? Well, I decided to follow up on something that uh, was recommended to me by both Tyler and Morgan, an album that I had just not gotten to uh, in forever. And I mentioned uh, last week that being uh, Talk Talk's uh, Laughing Stock. So because I loved that so much, I was like, well, I need to check out their other shit. And I listened to Spirit of Eden. And I will be good goddamn if that ain't just one of the best darn records I ever done here. Um, I I, I narrowly prefer it to Laughing Stock, in fact, but like I haven't spent enough time with either record to really dig into maybe why or hell, maybe that opinion could even reverse just because my uh, esteem for both of them is pretty fucking high, but holy shit. That is an album, my mm. God. Uh, I mean, just a consistent, a consistent mood. I think I mentioned to Tyler that it just kind of uh, gave me consistent vibes of a more ethereal version of Jeff Buckley's Grace at times. There are moments where it kind of has sort of a bluesier feel that I just, I fucking, oh, I'm really into that shit. Yeah, um, there's a deeply kind of, um, no pun intended but spiritual tone as well mm. to the music yeah. and and to i think most of talk talks music too there's a lot of sort of themes of religiosity and and the afterlife specifically yeah um and i'm not a spiritual person but anytime i put one of those last three talk talk records on or mark hollis's self-titled record i just like it's a religious experience um even the most hardened atheist i think couldn't deny there's something otherworldly about those albums that is really difficult to put into words. It, it, it simulates it as best the uh, us on the mortal plane can experience. And uh, yeah, those two records have made me be like, I am absolutely going to check out the rest of their albums as well as Mark Hollis's solo album, just because like I owe it to them. Um, uh, and speaking of uh experiences where I, I felt an elevated state of consciousness i also gave a first listen to my second beach house record bloom which ah god man that was just fucking excellent i i mean there was no universe in which i was not going to be all over that like i really really love depression cherry and just knowing what i know about beach house's sound i was just like I, I'm, I'm gonna dig this and lo and fucking behold i did yeah Um, just fucking sumptuous shoegazy dream pop beauty and uh, just fucking i ascend um i of course in preparation for today's record club listened to the entire discography of brockhampton uh which uh, i actually haven't done in some time just because i think since the podcast i've sort of gravitated away from some of the things that i have in my normal listening rotation 
Uh, and because Brockhampton has been so divorced from the current music climate since they dropped Ginger and fucking vanished. So uh, I, I just, that hasn't really been in my head too much. So that was kind of nice coming back to that, uh, listening to a lot of music that reminds me of the summer in, uh, uh, as I currently live in the Arctic fucking tundra. Um, yeah, all of us in America having a real, real, real spirited week over here when it comes to yeah. temperature. My, my only experience in Kentucky is middle of summer. So hearing you say you're living in Arctic tundra, it's, yep. I know it's unusual weather even for you, but it's just like insane to me. No, I mean, yeah, the, we the we weather here is as bipolar as me. Yeah. No, I know, I know you do. I know you do, but it's, it's yeah, just no. l- high contrast. Yeah, that's just the middle of America, just mm-hmm. bipolar weather. Yep, and I oh I just love it. Mm, it must be great. Said, both the middle and the the American South. Mm. Yeah, one one mode right now. No bipolar here, and that is got goddamn polar cold. It's yeah, cold. <laughs> and and speaking of things uh, inspired by the cold, uh, I listened to an an old favorite, of course, by an old favorite artist, and that being Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, which I am always listening to in some capacity, but I put on Murder Ballads, which is, for whatever reason, one of my least listened to upper tier Nick Cave projects. I don't really know why. I think maybe in my head, it's just like, oh, O'Malley's bar is fucking long, so I just like go to the albums that don't have songs that long, despite the fact that it's not a long album. Uh, but uh, yeah, that that album is fucking outstanding still to the shock of no one. Um, it's it's a blast. It's very fun. Quintessential Nick Cave. Maybe an album that I would say is uh, best to listen to when getting into that particular artist just because it's mm. so versatile and so emblematic of everything that's great about Nick as an artist. Yeah, and that was my first Nick Cave in the bad seats record yeah that and it's that and that's a good one to pick yeah. it was purely because it was called murder ballad so i, c- I couldn't ignore it really yeah it's um, just like it title <laughs> implies what it is he's just him yeah. singing about murder and it's like and, you know, fucking when it, dope. when it gets to the line where the barmaid said oh god he can't be dead he said just count the holes oh, it's it's mother, 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 head. Head. Just, oh, fuck. Mm, so serotonin good. right uh, there. it's it's good and on the complete side of the musical spectrum, uh, I got uh, I got a little, um, as the kids say, intoxicated the other evening. And I put on the band that I think is just, is like designed in a lab to be listened to while drunk. And that is the National. I listen to my favorite National record, Trouble Will Find Me. Um, another band that I just haven't listened to in like constant rotation for whatever reason, even though they're one of my favorite bands and I love so many of their albums, but yeah, um, it's perfect and uh, Fireproof makes me do the cry. Uh, good record. Yeah, we will uh, 100% be talking about the Nationals discography at some point in the near future. Mm-hmm. 100%. Mm-hmm. Yep, so that's what I've been listening to this week. Yeah, all right. I uh, suppose that's me. Mm-hmm. So first thing, I listened to my first record by the group The Cure, a bit of a uh, podcast favorite, that being their record uh, 17 Seconds, which is a, a good record with amazing highlights that is overall just kind of disposable. I wish yeah, fine. you had asked. <laughs> No, I, I, would have, I, I must concur. I must concur. No, to be fair, like, if you're going to listen to The Cure, it makes sense to start there, even though it's not one of their best records. I mean, I think that A Forest, for instance, is like a really strong contender yeah, no, for the best song, song ever. Yes. So it's a good place to start. I would say you can pro- not to diss it, because it's definitely a better record than... Um, then 17 seconds but i'd say you could probably get away with skipping over faith and go straight to pornography oh disagree but i'm one of the hardcore f- i'd no. say faith is where you should start with the cure to be honest yeah, I, Fa- Fa- to- faith is really good okay i take it back faith is a really good and it's a short album it's also too, short so. yeah faith yeah. is better and shorter so to defend my choice it was the first their first bolded album on yeah it, it's music. really well regarded on both sputnik and rate your music so, so i mean if I, if I were you i would have done the same i would have not known to ask because i just assumed oh this is a fine way to go 
Yeah. And, and I think if you, rather than kind of jumping to records like Disintegration and Wish, I think kind of building to them is probably yeah. going to yeah. give mm-hmm. you a better impression of the band. Um, so yeah, probably the best thing to do is start. I do Faith uh, faith, and then Head on the Door and then Pornography and just the rest of the canon after that. Mm, no, you should do Pornography next. Um, oh fair yeah putting my foot down on that one the pornography yeah. will absolutely be your favorite like if i had to put money on it like skipping faith for the moment does not mean skipping faith yeah yeah because don't no faith do that only pornography mm. that's true yeah anyway Amen. uh now to go into the segment of my uh opening segment where i talk about singer songwriter records that i loved completely out of character for me <laughs> uh, first off uh warren zivon's <gasps> zivon's classic record excitable boy yeah. Uh, it's this record's uh, it's fucking amazing it's just classic track after classic track the only song on there I might say I didn't like as much as the others was Werewolves of London which is ironically the biggest single what is wrong with you (laughs) this this has been well established okay (laughs) I can't believe what I'm hearing I, I don't I think the other tracks are just better. It's, it's a great I mean, they're album, all great, though. so I can't you know be too mad. Um, title track is my though. favorite. And if I woo nothing. No, it's a good song. I just don't like it as much as the other ones. Yeah, no, fair Straight enough. Can we get some love in the chat for Roland the Headless Thompson Gunner? Yeah, that one's amazing. What a song. In London. Cats in my way. Uh, Next up, the uh, I listened to my first Nick Cave album, Murder Ballads. (laughs) Huh. Interesting. What a meme. Uh, So just a fucking bizarre place to start. Yeah. Right. Uh, No, this was a this was a good record. Very good record. Uh, As I continued listening to it it just got better and better with every listen just the the totality of it it's like the warren zivon rec zivon fucking hell very darkly comedic it's very darkly comedic it's and, and at the same time very emotional at points the the ending bob dylan cover is great uh i mean it's all pretty great you know Eileen Minogue feature outsold yeah that's a good one too uh next continuing through my listening of the Frank Zappa Mothers of Invention discography I listened to We're Only In It For The Money they're a classic kind of uh almost Sergeant Pepper that Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band parody satire record while also satirizing a bunch of uh, the political stuff going on at the time. Uh, of the early Mothers of Invention stuff, I'd say you should, if you wanted to get into them, you should start here rather than freak out because it's a lot more uh, catchy and equally experimental and interesting. Uh, I'd say even better than freak out, but a uh, classic record ends with this really cool music concrete piece uh yeah check it out uh final thing i completed the studio discography of rush finally with clockwork angels anger yeah and it's like their best album in what uh fuck like 20 years at that point i think it's uh just one of their most solid records it's a beautiful reflection on their career presented through uh this kind of fun concept uh yeah it's just really good that's what i've been listening to fucking stacked week there there were other things that weren't as good but i didn't mention them because they were (laughs) bad well there you go what have you been listening to morgan uh well 
I think I'll tell you. Um, I'm glad you decided the, to do that. The two <laughs> mo- fuck yourself. The two <laughs> most notable uh, new listens of my week were both by the uh, jazz pianist Thelonious Monk. Um, oh yeah. Uh, first, fuck first yeah. being his album with John Coltrane, which I thought was very good, but it does feel like kind of loses both artists voice in some ways just from them working together it's like i don't know it's like if you got david bowie and queen to make a whole album together like it's probably not all is gonna is it gonna it's probably not all going to be as good as under pressure you know like there's yeah. just there's gonna have to be some sacrifices made and it does feel like that to some degree but still very excellent album it's like two of the best musicians to ever do do the thing um but after that i listened to brilliant corners which is a fantastic uh really idiosyncratic uh bebop album by monk um not much to say about it it's just very good a favorite of mr tom waits Mm. Yeah, it is a classic. Boy, it's the, absolutely the best place to start with um, with Monk. See, the only um, solo Monk record I've heard is Solo Monk, um, which is uh, his, it's just piano. And I, I like that very much, but I'd be excited to see if he's anything better. Yeah, due to um, an, all-time, an all-time great band leader. So obviously... Um, yeah, you do get like you get these great solo jazz musicians, um, like Monk and like Charles Mingus, for instance, who many forget was a bassist. And, um, you get them, you, you know, you think of them as band leaders, um, and you think of their compositional work, but then when you go and listen, actually focus on what they do as, as an artist, both within their groups and on their own, it's like you remember this whole other aspect of. What made them great? Sure. Uh, inspired by some talk of the best albums of the 80s the other day, I gave a re listen to The Cure's Pornography. Um, mm. Certainly not my favorite Cure album, but certainly a fucking certified S tier GOAT record. So. <laughs> Not even you know. top three cure for me, and it's still like peerless. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 wild. Yeah, uh, they were no, good. Yeah, they're all right. Uh, new record, Mr. Smith, maybe. Spare. Well, spare apparently, because uh, th- apparently they've had two albums finished for like a couple of years now. Uh, what they the what? And they they weren't sure if they wanted to release both of them, but but the last well I'm I, sure release them. <laughs> the last interview I read with Robert Smith, he sounded very keen to release one of them. So I'm hoping that it does spare album, sir. Sitting around with his thumb up his ass. What are you doing? Anyway, make me cry, bitch. Another another record <laughs> that I listened to in that. Uh, it's just. Yeah, un gato. <laughs> <laughs> he turned the webcam off. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway. Special guest um, starring August Cat's asshole. <laughs> which he, he, he used to turn the webcam off. He, he was like, I can I have some I he needs some privacy. <laughs> yeah, I need moment, Respectable. <laughs> uh, the other record that I listened to. Not for the first time, but the first time in a good while uh, was Bad Religion's 1988 record known as Suffer, which is one of the premier punk slash hardcore records of the 80s. And it fucking deserves that title. Uh, just 25 minutes of... Yeah. Yeah. I love 25 minutes of yeah. It's bad religion suffer you fucking get it i love 25 minutes of a year that's me listening to the back half of lcd sound system self-titled record you've done it at any rate 
have. I think that's actually only 20 minutes of year, but anyway. Okay, never yeah. talk again. I'm never gonna talk again about that. <laughs> Tyler, what do you think of the new slow tie record? Fuck did I miss? Well, <laughs> don't worry about it. I think your cat turned your webcam off with its anus. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Yeah, there was literally just this cat anus and then blackness. Oh and then Bruce. That's the way I want to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sir, what have you been listening to? So, um, I listened to one of the records, one of the two records that we as a collective have out of 10 that I hadn't heard. Um, that being A Storm in Heaven by The Ferv. Ah, I did not know you listened to that. Very That's interesting. okay. I loved it so yeah. much. Ah, it's just so, such a... Uh, uh, like the Wikipedia page has it listed as space rock and shoegaze. It's yes. shoegaze. It's shoegaze through and through. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like a shoegaze, but really, really like expansive and enormous and textural. And it was like there are certain tracks of like sledgehammer and my nuts made out of fuzz pedals. Blue um, do kind of be like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Ah. <laughs> uh, um. I think I might want to give it a few more listens. Probably would slap a 10 on it, but it's, um, oh boy, I loved it. Um, and I could see both of the other members of this podcast loving it too. I think yeah. um, I'm going to venture out on a limb here and, and suggest that I think you might like a Northern Soul even more than Storm in Heaven. I just feel like that's uh, an opinion that you might have, Sersha, because that record is <laughs> like Storm in Heaven, except it's louder, it's longer, and it's more wild. Um, and it's, that does, yeah. those are all things I like. It's true. And it's kind of <laughs> like the ugly middle child of the Verve's nineties run, and people overlook it, but I think it's really good. And don't skip out on their EP too, the debut oh, EP. Oh yeah, that's yeah. also EP fantastic. Is, yeah. is much closer to Storm in Heaven and very, very, very pretty. So you both rated that rather highly. Yes. Um, just because I'm trying to compress everything I want to talk about into um five slots i'm going to cover two records and one here because mm. these are both not allowed because uh, these are both idm records that i listened to this week oh. um the first being uh music has the right to children by uh, the boards of canada mm. which boy did i i vibe mm. with this record mm. um i really enjoyed it very much it's got a wonderful expansive mm. spacey mm. atmosphere to it um even mm. though it's quite stripped back it's really fun as well even though it's very sparse um and yeah the sort of monologue at the end against censorship made me very happy i enjoyed that very much i know it's a favorite of august so if you want to comment that's okay no i mean uh it it's a masterpiece. It's a 10 out of 10. Uh, it's like my second or third favorite album of all time, depending on the day. It's great. Yeah. Uh, so it's like a six? It was one of those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. It was one of those albums that kind of like shifted something in me. Because I heard it when I was really young. And it mm-hmm. was like an album that just changed my whole perspective on. No, uh, yeah. Similar, very similar myself. Although I heard it much more recently. And what's yeah. so like fascinating to me is like it's this very pure and, and childlike record that has this real sense of innocence to it intentionally. And what's really fascinating is the way that they kind of completely corrupt that on the on Yeah, Getty, no, exactly. The album and that... that they released after it. And and so they've had a, they haven't released many records, but their discography is really interesting, I think, and it yeah, says no. a lot that they're considered one of the one of the greats, uh, despite having only four proper albums. Yeah, no. Although they do have a, a number of EPs, which oh, do yeah. uh, do help that catalog expand. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Well, the other IDM record I listened to this this week it was uh, "Confield" by Orteca. Um, Anger. Which, uh, importantly, I listened to was reading a David Cronenberg novel, looking out through my office window on frost, snowy English fields, first thing in the morning with my morning coffee. 
and that completely reinformed my experience with the album was that sort of context and all those influences and textures uh, and this is my uh, like as I have said um, aside from listening to AFX Twin a little bit in my teen years uh, Confield is my first full length IDM record listen ever when I first listened to it oh what a fucking um, what a way to enter that fucking world <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> I always yeah, that, that, that was that was one that like basically like Tyler, you said that it was like something shifted in you when you heard Boards of Canada. Like that was me with Com because like I had heard like Amber and stuff, but I was like, I don't know. I like I don't I'm not sure if I fully get IDM. And then I listened it's to that like, and by the end of it I was just like, holy shit, I get it's it. It's like it's like <laughs> if someone's never heard rock music and you give them yeah. singing by stripping young lad. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, can you all? Oh, can you fucking imagine? It's just like, yeah, I've only growing up, grown up hearing like radio hits, and then you give them city and just be like, just listen to this. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I think at the time I quite I liked it a lot, but of course I couldn't like fully appreciate what it was doing. Um, and now, like, I, I was just struck by how Confueled by Orteca is just one of the best fucking albums anyone's ever made with like human ears. Um, just. An absolute masterpiece. I um, agree. <laughs> they made it with human ears. That's messed up. Yeah. In the blend. And I, I, I predict, I predict, Sersha, that that will not be the last Orteker album that you have that experience with on a revisit, <laughs> because those records, like to for, to me, they sound different every time I listen to them. And I mean, yeah. like the two the two thousand stuff, especially like. There just is just so much happening that there's no way you can really kind of process it all the first time you hear it anyway. That's why Oversteps is my favorite. It feels so formless. It just every mm. time I come back to it, I'm just like, whoa, this is new. Well, well Oversteps is my favorite or tech record, but I, I have yet to re-listen to it. And I think before I now make a decision what's going to be my favorite going forward, I want to re-listen to both again and then like the rest of their catalog. Um, yeah. But no, um, on the subject, they did make it with human ears and they put it in a blender and they sampled the sound oh, for Uviol, which is shit. <laughs> that's uh, nasty, nasty. No, um, another sort of surprise listen that Tyler commented on my review with rating, sorry, was unexpected. Oh, yeah, here we go. Was, I'm curious to hear about how you can justify this considering oh, other, other oh, ratings dear. for the artist. <laughs> um, I would like to ahead. preface this by saying that before I listened to this, I had very much liked individual songs that were contemporary to this piece by the same artist. Um, oh, the and hell that's being this? Pop 2 by Charlie XCX. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I saw this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, Great, a, a very good album. I'm not going to disagree with that it's a very good album. But considering that you loved a 4 out of 10 on how I'm feeling now, I'm really curious what made this click for you. Well, I put a thought on how I'm feeling now when that was like a very fresh thing for me on our very first episode of this. And I re-listened to, I, li I really got into sort of the hyper pop thing, if you want to call it that, since then. And then re-listened to how I'm feeling now. And I had a very similar reaction of just being very uninterested in it. Um, but I listened to pop too. And it's got a lot of the, the sort of a lot of ideas that I can see coming to a full fruition on that album, but it's just stuffed to the brim with, with hooks I find incredibly compelling as well. Um, and I, I just really enjoyed the uh, like how it is very clearly like a pop record that's incredibly catchy that every song was like, I am clicking along to this. I'm really enjoying the vibe it's giving me, but it also is very obviously an album by the person who made the Vroom Vroom EP um, or a mixtape rather, I suppose. Yeah. Like it's totally the, um, the kind of realization of the potential of that EP, I think. And it's not, I don't think it's as consistently front to back brilliant as um, how I'm feeling now, but what, um, what Pop 2 is that that record isn't is it's a really great exercise in collaboration um, mm. because how I'm feeling now has, has no collaborators um, in terms of singing and, and that sort of yeah. thing, whereas Pop there, 2 there is some, just yeah. filled to the brim with them and they're all yeah. really well chosen and executed. 
Um, yeah. And they kind of elevate the songs in really interesting ways, and it makes it feel like this big collective. On that record. I would agree exactly with what you just said. Uh, but a record I really want to highlight uh, this week that um, came out without my knowledge and I haven't seen get much attention. Um, it's a new record by Loathe, who I talked about the last record in 2020 on a previous one of these segments, but they came out with a new album a couple of weeks ago um, called The Things They Believe. Um, and they brought on some new collaborators to join in with this record. First of all, Peter Vibriol and a son whose name I can't read my handwriting, but they're part of a metal band called Parting Gift. But they also brought on the session and touring saxophonist for the 1975. Um, and I knew this before I listened to the record and I was like, all right, so the, your previous record is this wonderful sort of atmospheric metal thing. What are you doing bringing on a saxophonist to collaborate on this record? Is this going to be like a pop record? Because um, I was not expecting such a hard tonal shift. But no, it's an ambient record. Um, and uh, it's like the unholy love child f between Vangelis and Colin Stetson. Um, oh. um, which yes. that sounds amazing. I and just want to... Yeah. Sorry, actually, no, I'll wait till you're finished because I got a, a thing I want to put a pin in. That That's see. okay. Um, but I absolutely adore this so much. I listened to it, the first time I listened to it was like afternoon yesterday. Uh, and I've since listened to it three times. Um, the first time I listened to it, I, I was crying at the end of it. And this is like this very stripped back ambient like synth record and I was sitting there in my chair with tears rolling down my face um I, I this is going to be a contender for like my favorite record of the year by the end uh and there's another record that I'm not going to talk about because I think Tyler's going to mention it where it's like in the space of three weeks three contenders for my like favorite records of the year have all come out and it's insane um yeah uh I also listened to Self-Titled by the Velvet Underground. Um, it's a self-titled by the Velvet Underground. It's great. What do you want from me? You know, Their best um, album, in my opinion. I don't disagree with you. Um, and because I've already filled five slots, I'm just going to say that inspired by our 80s talk, I listened to uh, Treasure by the Cocteau Twins, and it was great. Also, a bit the best album of a band that you have talked about, um, in my opinion. I just wanted to put a pin in the in the saxophones and metal thing because um, very few people remember this, um, but actually Colin Stetson made a black metal record um, mm -hmm. called, uh, not to be confused with the Autaker album, called XI uh, with a, a band that he put together. I can't remember who else is in it, but I know it's another, there are other people in it who I know as well. But anyway, that record is great and super slept on and there should be more saxophones in middle in my opinion well uh, yes th there's the song uh, another day by dream theater which has a notable sax solo mm. that's true another metal yes. sax yeah it's, i feel like i said i i say all the time i just more sax solos and music please and then loathe and black country new road heard me and said yes what i Here you go what I, what I want is i want like a saxophone solo on the next like fucking deaf heaven record or something i don't even know i'm just oh, oh yes. what is... i would not i would not rule it out Fuck. Uh, which is i'm sure I, i'm pretty sure is going to come out this year but it hasn't been announced yet um anyway a behemoth record probably it, uh, yes anyway uh what i've been listening to the past week i'll start off with a re-listen because it ties into an artist that's already been mentioned multiple times I re-listened to Nick Cave's Ghostine, um, and uh, it's now my favorite Nick Cave album. I don't know what to yeah, say. It it is. Just, it's, yeah, it's, it is. Yeah, it is. Sad bastard music. Yeah, I hate to like take it away from one of the sort of 1990 to, 90 to 2001 classic period, um, but because those records are much more dynamic than Ghostine, which um, I think that Nick Cave would admit because Ghostine is very purposefully, uh, the arrangements are much more sparse, they're organized around a lot of um, Warren Ellis's sort of soundscapes and sound play and these kind of lush, beautiful string arrangements and real, a much more minimal record. And of course, being like 70 minutes long, uh, that kind of style for that amount of time is not gonna be for everyone. Uh, but I found it utterly 
enrapturing from start to finish, particularly reading, watching the um, lyric video that Nick Cave mm -hmm. has put up for the whole album on YouTube, which I think is one of the best ways you can experience the record. Um, yeah, just incredible poetry. Uh, I think that um, the title track is honestly a contender for one of his best um, songs, uh, both musically and lyrically uh but the whole thing is is stellar sun forest is literally the most beautiful song i've ever heard sun like, forest sun forest into, sun forest into galleon ship back to mm -hmm. back two of the most gorgeous things mm -hmm. composed by human ears we will be talking about ghosting here on the podcast in mm -hmm. relatively uh small time actually yeah, one of your picks, i think i believe it's it, it, not mine and morgan's no, it's yours, and it's mm. next up in the cycle for you, I think. Oh, okay, yeah. so in five weeks' time then. Um, so that'll be exciting. You've already kind of got a, a sneak preview of that. Um, so, but the rest of the records I want to talk about, four more records, are all, were all first listens, uh, and like all of these are either tens or nines. Um, so I had a very good week for first listens. Um, I want to kick off with... Uh, actually, I'll kick off by talking about the nines, because it's got two nines and two tens. Um, the first record I want, I want to mention that I listened to is I listened to Coheed and Cambria's In Keeping Secrets of Silent Earth 3. Uh, yeah! Uh, uh, holy macaroni. Uh, what a record. <laughs> Remember when what you a... said you weren't, you didn't think you were going to like that band? And now... The reason <laughs> I said that is because you were showing me a music video of theirs that was shittily compressed through a Zoom call. And so it wasn't the way to experience this band. This is Fair an enough. album band. Yeah, but you weren't. You weren't like, uh, this isn't the way to experience this. Like you were like, this is trash. <laughs> <You were. laughs> like what you said. Which Whoa. which we can't we can't be too hard on you because there is literal footage on the internet of Morgan and I talking about how much we don't like Coheed and Cambria. Yeah. No, that's yeah. exactly why we should talk trash because it's hilarious <laughs> that way. Yeah. No, look, I I love the record. Um, I I I love their debut, Second Stage Turbine Blade. I thought that was a really great album. And, um, but this is just a complete leveling up from that. Really, really impressive. In many ways, yeah. I don't know if, if, I don't know if uh, you're going to find this sacrilegious or not, but I found it, the experience of it very similar to uh, My Chemical Romance's Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. Uh, except, I don't think it's sacrilegious at all. I think that's a perfect comparison. Except the difference between the two records is that um, the Coheed and Cambria record is much more kind of progressive and, and massive and colossal and the there are pieces that stretch for 10 minutes on this thing as well as these perfect yes. chunks of like yes. pop songs you have and you have basically a favorite house atlantic just wrapping a bow around the whole thing mm -hmm. my favorite song um which is uh, probably obviously not a hot take because that's a beloved song no it's um, not particularly but die no. white girls am i right <laughs> Oh, my whole, favorite fucking song hook like ever that, that, <laughs> that whole trilogy of songs um, in the back half <sighs> that climaxes with that was really great i love i wish i wish more artists would do like song suites um or like three-part songs just and just chuck them in the right in the middle of your album like what dan deacon did on mystic familiar um yeah. i love that shit just chuck a oh, fucking, yeah. chuck a fucking suite right in the middle of the thing um but no, uh, really, really dope album. Loved it. Uh, yeah. I've been listening to it again it's and again. Awesome. Uh, and looking forward to their next record after it. Um, a second mm. record I want to shout out, uh, and this was a little more contentious. Four years, kind of... Coheed. Where is your next album? Sorry, go on. No, no, that's that's a reasonable um, thing to say. But no, next record I want to shout out. I know is a little, my my feelings is a little bit more contentious on this, considering that um, we discussed it on Twitter yesterday. But I listened to Iron Maiden's Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, the final record in their kind of golden run um, before they had a little bit of turbulence in the '90s and then rebounded. I'm I'm to believe after that. Um, but I've gone through Iron Maiden's discography in chronological order. Uh, and I uh, and I stopped after Somewhere in Time, which is still my favorite Iron Maiden record. Uh, I don't know why I stopped. I think maybe maybe it was that you had mentioned that you weren't as hot on Seventh Son, so I kind of just put it off. Um, but I eventually got to it thanks to Laura, actually, um, who I listened to it with, and is her favorite Iron Maiden record. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> 
I liked it a lot. I loved it actually. I don't think it's the best Iron, Iron Maiden record. Uh, it's certainly Iron not. <laughs> it, it's certainly it's certainly not on the level of of Summer in Time and Power Slave. But I would say it's. Oh, it's beat, it's battling with the self-titled for third place after that. I just loved it so much. I, I particularly loved the more kind of proggy, definitely Rush-inspired arrangements or like styles. There was only one really long song on it, which is the title track, but that was the best thing there by far, I think. Um, it has that great sense of theatrics that all the best Iron Maiden stuff has. It has a really cool concept about kind of European folk myth, I think. Um, I didn't dig to hit heaps into it, but I found the allusions to it that were there quite interesting. Um, yeah, I think there are some songs where the hooks are a bit grating. Um, the third track in particular comes to mind, and I can't remember the name of it now. But um, generally, overall, I thought it was great. Um, definitely, um, two, I think the title track and the second track uh, are definite instant um, Lee going on my top 10 Iron Maiden songs list. Those two songs are great. Um, really, I'm annoyed I can't remember the name of the second track now. But anyway, really, really great album. I definitely can understand a little, I can sort of understand why some people might not be as hot on it, but at the same time, it definitely feels of a piece with the records that came before it. So uh, I'm just pleased. That, that, that's it. the thing is that some people are literally just me and Morgan. Like this is one of the most beloved records from that band and in that genre in general like you are not like straying from the grain here like this is just a weird opinion that morgan and i happen to share yeah and that look that's fair um i i hate saying that's fair but i just did it so that's fair uh but anyway <laughs> to to elevate even further i gave two records first listen tens this week um, the first one is um strange times by the chameleons uh, which uh, I listened to uh, at the urgent request of uh, our mutual friend Spencer, who has been bugging me to listen to this record for weeks now. And I <laughs> actually, not a funny story, but I'm laughing for some reason. Um, he, I was gonna, I was sitting down to listen to it uh, like three weeks ago on the night that I heard about Sophie's death. Um, and then I just didn't listen to it for obvious reasons. Um, so I was like, okay. I'm, time has passed and I'm now like, I really need to listen to this record because Spencer has been bugging me to listen to it. And holy shit, this mm -hmm. thing is amazing. Uh, it's just front to back fantastic. If you're a fan of The Cure, uh, it's very much uh, in the similar vein to their kind of late 80s stuff, but it's more anthemic instead of having the kind of like dour um, dramatics of Robert Smith, you have a, a singer who is much more kind of vocally adventurous. Um, and the songs are great. There's that classic sort of 80s twangly guitar sound, but the songs are kind of uh, epic and they soar. Um, and Swamp Thing, the song at the center of the record is one of the best songs of the 80s. Like just, it just is, you can't disagree with that because you're just demonstrably wrong. Um, and I know that <laughs> I'm that confident in its greatness. Um, but yeah, amazing, amazing album. Uh, also, I want to shout out the track. Um, I want to, I think it's called In Answer, but I'm afraid that's not the title, so I'm going to check um, real quickly. Uh, yeah, In Answer is one of the best love songs of the 80s. Super, super great song. There's actually a run of four or five tracks on the first half of this record from Caution through to the end of time that is just like peerless like disintegration level great um amazing album i will definitely be checking out more of their records yeah i i, I am and i know jake likes this record as well i'm always preaching the gospel of their previous record uh script of the bridge script um, of the bridge fucking owns great yeah, album. I, yeah i haven't heard that one but that'll be the next one i listen to from them for most sure. of what you described about that record i think would apply to that so yeah Yep. Well, fuck, sign me up. Um, and the last record I want to shout out, um, the best record I listened to this week uh, is uh, I'm finally, after hearing a lot about her in the music world, I'm finally getting into the discography of Tori Amos, um, the, the singer-songwriter um, who came to prominence in the 90s. Um, she uh, is a pianist and 
Um, she gets a lot of vocal comparisons to Kate Bush, and she does admittedly have a lot of similar vocal intonation qualities to Kate Bush, but in all other respects, she's a very different songwriter. I listened to her record, her debut record, Little Earthquakes, which is one of the best debut albums I think I've ever heard. Um, re just incredible songwriting. Um, uh, some of the best songs ever. I, I, I have already added it to our list of record clubs for a bit later down the line because I think there's a lot to get into in terms of the narrative behind the record, the stories that Tori tells on it and the themes. Um, but I have only heard the record uh, once and well, I've heard some songs on it many times now, but I want to sort of get to know it a little bit more before I talk about it at depth, but it's just one of those records that really like takes you aback in terms of how classic the songwriting feels and how uh, compelling Tori is as a singer and as a writer. Um, she just absolutely commands your attention throughout the record and she never lets it go. Uh, and that's, I think, and that's what's so great about her from what I can tell so far. And I'm looking forward to digging into the rest of her sort of classic era of records in the nineties. Um, yeah, amazing album, so good. and. That's my week. Nice. Pretty nice. stellar week, all things considered. For most of us, it seems. Yeah. yeah. All right, so that means now it's time to dig into our new release reviews. First up on the slab is Slow Tie with Tyron. Um, so uh, Slow Tie, um, you probably are aware of Slow Tie. Slow Tie's rise to prominence has been fast in the last few years. Um, a British rapper, a hip hop artist, um, um, but not a grime artist. A lot of people think when they think of sort of British hip hop, they think of grime, but Slow Tie has kind of emerged of, in sort of his own little wee bubble, I think, um, and made waves with his sort of 2019 debut record, Nothing Great About Britain. Kind of this enfant terrible figure who kind of emerged to yeah. talk shit about you know Boris Johnson famously held up a paper mache of Boris Johnson's seared head at the Mercury Prize Awards I think or the Brit Awards or one of those things um so this very sort of he had he had points to be made <laughs> no absolutely this figure who certainly uh emerged trying to be sort of edgy in court controversy but in a way that was substantive and meaningful and his debut record was really good I think it showed a lot of promise yeah. had some great songs on it um, but Slow Tie had a troubled 2020 um, I think uh, just before the pandemic started there was a controversial incident uh, at the at a, when he was receiving an award for being a hero of some sort I can't remember the specific award context, but anyway, when he was when he went up to the, receive the award, I think he got into an altercation, and then made sexually inappropriate comments towards the host uh, of the presentation, Catherine Ryan, uh, and there was this very um, tense altercation that happened, and Slow Tie did not come out of it looking very good at all, um, and and it was yeah yeah was, yeah you don't you don't. You don't go at the Canadian comedian, you know. And, and you know, interestingly enough, you may want to interpret this in a number of different ways, but Catherine Ryan did say that a lot of it was misconstrued. and She, she did. She did. She say wasn't uh, upset with what happened, but, you know, it's a, either way, it didn't look very good. And then what happened yeah. was as soon as, just after that, the pandemic happened. And so we kind of all stopped thinking about slow tie to the extent that we even were. Um, and, yeah. and so, but it is interesting to think, about, I think all of this context is important to establishing what Tyron is as a record uh, and where um, Slow Tie's head is at as an artist sort of approaching um, the crucial point of a sophomore record following up a, an enormously successful debut. Um, Nothing Great About Britain was Mercury Prize nominated, I believe. And so there's a, and as well as being kind of just hugely successful in the US as well as in the UK, Slow Tie had uh, great crossover success certainly uh, a, a good example of that would be his feature on um the last brockhampton record as well which was kind of ha which happened at the same time where he was kind of coming to prominence and so the question was you know where would slow tie go next because there is 
I think there's an inherent limitation to a shtick that's organized around being this kind of like, you know, edgy and, you know, fuck authority figure, um, particularly someone who's as kind of manic and um, freewheeling as Slow Tie. And so I think that with Tyron, uh, it's clear that Slow Tie is making an attempt to kind of pivot away from that a little bit. This is a much more introspective record. Um, but I think it is also kind of caught between two different pathways for a slow tie to take. Uh, and, and slow tie himself has kind of made this deliberate and clear um, in the way that he's structured this record. You have seven songs that are kind of designed to be more bangers, designed to kind of follow in the footsteps of nothing great about all Britain. caps. Yeah, all caps on the track listing. And then you have seven songs that are more introspective. Um, or that's not the right word because I think there's a lot of introspection on the first half as well, but more kind of moodier. Uh, Contemplative, and, I'd say. Yeah, mm. exactly. And so you clearly by design, Slow Tie has is wanting to illustrate how he's caught at a crossroads at this point in his career. Um, and that's not necessarily a surprise. Like when you're an artist and um, uh, artists' worst compulsion sometimes is just to write about their career and their status and where they're at. And sometimes you can make great music out of that. And there's an album we'll be talking about in our record club today that very much is an example of that. And sometimes you can kind of come across purely um, stuck in a state of unfixed identity. And I think that's the issue that Tyron has. Um, there are plenty of moments of um, fun and genuine glee on the record, as well as plenty of moments of emotion and introspection that feels real and genuine and even a little bit heartbreaking at certain points. Um, but I do think that the record feels rushed and it feels not as finessed as the first album. And perhaps that is sort of an intentional decision. Perhaps like it's again trying to capture the chaos and we're not, I'm not going to overthink any of this. I just want to get out how I'm feeling. Uh, and in that respect, um, being a quarantine record, it has the feel of a quarantine record through and through. Um, but I don't really think that it comes to life uh, in the moments where Slow Tie is trying to um, continue the route that he came from. Uh, I think the first half of the record in particular feels for the most part kind of sloppy. I do actually, and I'm curious to see where everyone else's feelings fall on this, but I do actually think that the track cancelled is quite good it's one of the better tracks here i think um and that because it, the title it, is so like doesn't have to do with the song like well, the hook to... and the contents of the actual song are like not really that related yeah exactly so you, you get skipped on here um and oh god i just fucking on as an aside i just my blood starts pumping every time i hear skip to start rapping he's just like he's, he's just he's such just... a fucking He's just like one of the best feature, like yep. feature artists working today. Like uh, on the Kid Cudi record re we reviewed, he killed that track. On the Slow Tie record we're reviewing today, he kills this track. It's just immaculate that he can bring so much life to like everything he touches. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he absolutely demolishes the hook. He's great. And his verse is excellent as well. Um, and obviously it's very much um, what, yeah, and I kind of like the subversion of like, you know, trying to draw ire with the hook and with the, um, you know, content of the, of the title and the content of the hook and then kind of going for something a little bit more introspective with the actual writing of the song. But then again, on the other side of the coin, it does kind of leave the track feeling as though it doesn't necessarily have a cohesive identity or as a song, but it's catchy enough. I, I think it's really good. I think um, <laughs> there's a, an allusion in Skepta's verse to Hodorowski, which I thought yeah. was really funny. Yeah. Um, like not even a movie, like actually 
Alejandro Hodorowski, and I was just well, like, it is it is a Hodorowski movie that he yeah. references, but yeah, yeah, directly he just says his name, and it's yeah. like, Damn. and, and I, I think that's cool, and I want to see more um, mainstream rappers making references to um, you know art house legends. Um, but yeah, I think the rest of the first half of the record kind of is a bit of a shrug. I do think that the song "Play with Fire" is the best track on the first half. And I think that might be due in part to being so thematically and stylistically linked to the second half of the record. It's uh, It serves as a nice kind of transitory point, um, but is also kind of an affecting song in its own right. Uh, and then I tried the first song of the second half, um, gives you a little bit more of this. And, and those two songs back to back together, I think are pretty good. Um, then while I do prefer the second half, it is kind of, frustrating it does feel kind of frustratingly unfinished in its own way as well um there's a lot of the production some of the production is great like particularly um the production from mount kimby on uh the track with mount kimby and james blake which i'll get to in a minute but then you have other points like um kenny beats production on focus where i'm just like not as engaged um, musically with what's happening and this is kind of like I was thinking about this about Kenny Beats as a producer um, because I am definitely not going with the consensus here because he's pretty beloved but I find him to be perfectly competent but unimpressive as a producer and I think his popularity is more reflective of his PR skill and online presence than actual talent but I will say that the beat on this track is, is certainly better than some of the ones more anonymous beats early on. Um, even if I think that the song itself is a bit forgettable. Uh, I do think though that there is uh, an energy that Slow Tie finds towards the final stretch of the record that um, sees a lot of the best songs come to the fore. Uh, Terms is a good song, aided by Dominic Fike on the hook, another Brockhampton connection. Uh, and initially, I was sad that Denzel Curry, who's also kind of assisting on the hook, um, doesn't have a verse of his own on the song. But I do like the way that Slow Tie kind of reaches an emotional climax in his second verse on the track that maybe Denzel might have distracted from if he were also present. So um, whatever, at the end of the day, I think that the acoustic lead push is a great fit for Slow Tie. Um, also, and I also think that you see that obviously you see the Brockhampton connection coming back again on the track uh, NHS with the inclusion of vocalist Deb Never, who um, Brockhampton fans will remember from Ginger. Um, and also the intro of the song sounds um, like uh, a Brockhampton song, I think. I, I, I wrote that down when I was listening to it. Although yeah. the, track, the track then becomes quite different, I think it becomes this piano lead ballad. Uh, which I think immediately stands out. Uh, I think that Slow Tie's writing scheme on this track is quite cute too. The way he considers his problems in his life and the world around him in terms of dichotomies. Uh, and he strings together some lines that I think hit harder by association and give you a sense of Slow Tie's perspective. For example, what's a country with no coat of arms, an estate with no dogs that bark, a club with no cunts who laugh at people trying to have a laugh. Um, he just does this whole thing where he kind of strings together the stream of consciousness um, set of dichotomies that I think is one of his most lyrically sharp moments on the record. Uh, and then you get, I think, what, what the best song on the record is, which is the, the Mount Kimby and James Blake feature track, Feel Away, which um, is dedicated to Slow Tie's brother who died as a child. Uh, it's incredibly moving. Uh, and Slow Tie, once again, I think reminds us how well he can strike a more varied emotional scope. Uh, I do think to a certain extent that James Blake, who I'm an unabashed fan of, kind of steals the show a little bit on this song. Uh, his, when he comes in vocally, he's just, God, he's got a great voice. And I love uh, the line, uh, I leave the dent in my car to remind me uh, what I could have lost. It's beautiful evocation of... Um, of uh, you know that kind of sense of existential pain that's all throughout the song, um, and yeah, I think it's just a really, really great moment on the album. Uh, and then ADHD, I think, is a really strong closer too. Um, you get the kind of grief of um, feel away kind of bubbling over into 
uh, anger at people who refuse to attempt to understand Slow Tie's perspective or his emotional state. The title is a reference to the fact that his parents refused to acknowledge his ADHD and his hyperactivity as a part of a disorder, but assumed that it was just subconscious choice that he was making to be this, um, you know, troublemaker when in fact, you know, he was never really fully understood. Uh, and I think ultimately in that, in the way he kind of elaborates on that in the song, you kind of get the themes of the album encapsulated. The idea of people who distance themselves from the perspective of others rather than trying to empathize. And the way that all of this just leads to self-loathing and resentment towards the world. Uh, and um, I think uh, Slow Tie gets that across beautifully um, with the song. And but I, as a whole, I do think just to kind of wrap up that it does, the album does feel musically more lacking than nothing great about Britain. Uh, many of its best moments are over far too soon. Like this is a 14 track album that's 35 minutes long. Uh, it feels as though many of the tracks were just not properly fleshed out and didn't really find their own uh, sense of unique identity. Um, some, there are some instances where it feels like Slow Tie just wrote a hook, a verse, maybe a second verse, and just said, that's it. Um, this is a common trend uh, in a lot of um, sort of hip hop music at the moment. And it's not something that I'm necessarily into unless it's some way, in some way kind of like cohesively part of the musical experience. Um, like for instance, I think there's one track here, I think it's Mazza where Slow Tie is almost doing like a Cardi flow uh, or like a Cardi voice approximation. And it doesn't particularly work for me because it sort of clashes with other parts of the record where he seems to be being much more serious and forthright. Um, but I think it captures nicely the sense that he, in which he's kind of like caught between two different musical directions. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, while it would have been nice to see these songs more polished, uh, it's not a bad record. Uh, the highlights are really good, I think, as I said. Um, and I'm hoping that he puts a little bit more time and focus and finesse into the next record, um, whatever direction he decides to take it in. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, to be honest, I don't really think that, like, not to presuppose for all of my podcast mates here, but I can't really imagine a lot of us have a, a lot to add to that, frankly. <laughs> but um, I'll just oh. run over some things because, um, boy, howdy, Tyler. I, I literally, yes, all, all of what you said, pretty much. I just kind of agree with all of it. If it um, makes you feel any better, I am going to have next to nothing to say about the next record, so... <laughs> I, I, it, it doesn't but um, I, <laughs> um that said um i i think there are a few things that kind of hold this bag for me because i think i think it's a good record that's just sort of like it's a good record despite the fact that it kind of feels like it's in a constant state of trying to sabotage itself of being a mediocre one and it's like really frustrating because like like you said, he, he, like, Slow Tie was a dude who came out with his debut album, and it's like this, he's really good at this one specific thing, and honestly, I compare him, and you actually made the distinction of him not being grime, uh, that said, the artist he makes me think of the most consistently is Stormzy, and I feel like Stormzy sort of, like, is his mirror reflection in terms of, like, artistic success, because they both have a very similar ethos on their first album, and then their second album is them trying to flex their versatility a little bit more and be a little bit more adventurous, and I think Stormzy succeeded in spades on that record. Whereas I think this kind of flails about, I think that the, like, it's Slow Tie trying to do so many like different things and like have this ambitious structuring to his record and like inviting all these people and having a uh, production that largely is like pretty adventurous and interesting sounding and yet it's still him just kind of doing what he's always been doing and as a result it feels more like anything different is just kind of a gesture kind of a half measure and even though the record is divided into these two distinct halves I still don't feel like there's enough of a difference between them like there's just like in terms of 
music yes but in or i guess in like pure like aesthetics yes but in terms of like the actual vibe that is being achieved by what he is laying out there it's it's basically the same like i don't really feel like the 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 only time where it feels like this is something that strengthens the album is when it transitions into the second half is that that sort of feels like a real definitive point where he's like trying to execute an idea and does so well uh but the rest of it just it just feels kind of empty and, and strange and it's a 35 minute long album and there's 14 songs so a, a lot of these songs just don't have enough to them there's not enough meat on their bones to be able to like if he worked on some of these tracks that were like just a minute long or a minute and a half long or even two minutes and decided to really like flesh them out and try to emphasize the difference on the two halves a little bit more he might have something there but in his like he hasn't grown enough as an artist for I think for him to like go for something this ambitious and I also just I don't this is very this is a complaint that's just it's very it's probably less his fault and more mine but like I don't know what exactly the difference is like I can't quantify it or try to tell you why nothing great about Britain does it well and I don't think this record does it as well but it's like I kind of find Slow Tie to be sort of an obnoxious presence on this album. And unbelievably fucking annoying. It's yeah. he, th- like he's able to do it in a way that works on the first time. But then there are moments on here that reminded me of like mid career Eminem when he's trying a little right. too hard. And you're yeah. just kind of like, uh, like, if, if, what if are I you can, doing? If, if, if I can make a point there, right? Like, when yeah. you're making your first record, it's so actively political. You can be like the young upstart that is a bit snot nose and a bit slappable because you're, you are sort of thumbing your nose at authority in that way. The, the Green Day approach, as it yeah, were. Yeah, exactly. But like on a song like Cancelled, which I'll get onto more on when I, when I talk about the record, um, he it comes across like his just knowledge um, and especially Skeptus knowledge of everything he is trying to deal with. It's thoroughly inept. So that attitude just comes across like, I, I do want to slap you and I just don't <laughs> care for what you have to say. Yeah, there's sort of like the, if you're going to adopt this persona, there has to be a part of you that like, I still want to root for, you know? And it's not like it's totally devoid of that. It's just that there's not enough of it. He's not good enough at balancing his persona with his songs in a way that like, like if I listened to Nothing Great About Britain, I can give you an idea of what Slow Tie is as an artist. If I listen to this and not that album, I couldn't fucking tell you. Like the the things that make him stand out the most are the things that rub me the wrong way on this album. Like despite the fact that I think the production's very good, um, I think the feature work uh, in the second half of the album is like uniformly really, really, really good. Uh, I, I do like Skepta on Cancelled. That said, I think ASAP Rocky on Mazza is like virtually anonymous. I, I wouldn't know who it was I, unless it was listed. I just don't like Mazza at all. It's a really no. It's song. not. It's not a very good it, song, is it, it? it? It doesn't help that it's got like the most annoying hook on the record. Oh. It's going like Mazza yeah. Yin Ya, Mazza Yin Ya. It's, I, I it's do so want to. I do want to chime like, in just to say um, that I do think that you get quite a bit of that slow tie you can root for in the second half of the record. Agreed. Yeah, the, issue, no. the issue is that it doesn't feel like slow tie has the strength of his convictions to just make that the album. Yeah, I, that's the thing is that it's like the first half of this album is slow tie trying to do what he has proven himself to already be good at but like not doing it as well. And then the second half of the album is him trying to do something new and doing it demonstrably better. So then it comes off as just being really fucking confused. And, yeah. I, and I just, I'm, I'm left with being like, this needed so much more time in the oven. And like, you know, maybe there's a bit of a glass ceiling with him uh, as an artist for me, just because it's like, again, I don't 
super dig his his vibe and and delivery a lot of the time sometimes it's just a bit too sometimes it's just a bit too obnoxious for my liking and i know that's I, i'm probably coming off a bit as like you know old man yells at cloud no but, i i i well, think maybe that, you should be less fucking obnoxious is i think that he, his his like little interlude on the Bro last brockhampton album is by far and away the worst part of that record and i wish it wasn't on there i I'm I'm someone who like I'll come to the defense of that little snippet on Ginger is that I like it because that's just it, it's him like you know he, he's obviously reinforcing the the theme of the album but it's also just like it comes at a perfect spot on that record for you to get just the right amount of dose of what he's doing whereas here it's just like okay you got a dose there and that was fine and now here's like 50 it's like a sugar rush it's just like here's a bunch of shit and it's just like isn't this album 35 minutes long why does why does it feel like this why does it feel <laughs> overstuffed <laughs> getting a sugar rush is the best moment best feeling i have when i listen to ginger is getting a rush of the song sugar Ah, anyway, um, I, I just, I, 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 fuck God, I'm a dog backwards. That's the fucking <laughs> stupid shit he says on that song. The, well, even, even still, it's like, I can get behind the, the irreverence, the stupid shit, but it's also like, I don't understand why, like it, the, one of the most disappointing moments on the album to me is comes on a song that I don't think is bad, um, but it's push. And I just like, the way that Brock Hampton uses Deb Never on No Halo and the fucking night and day difference of her just like being here and like adding basically nothing to this song. Like it's an anonymous feature for, and it kills me because it's like she has proven that she could carry a fucking song with like one repeated refrain and it just doesn't happen here and i don't know it, it, it makes it's like it's a mixed bag that favors positivity and benefits from the fact that it does in fact go by at a, at a brisk enough pace but it also feels so skeletal in my opinion this is like the premier example of what i think of when i think of a sophomore slump and that it's not a bad album it's just like you come out the gate swinging with an album that really gets the attention of a lot of people and then on the second album you basically you're just like kind of high on your own success and you try to do too much and you end up spreading yourself way too thin yeah well, i know it's often tempting to say with mid albums that have great highlights that they would be better as eps but i genuinely think that the second album i had the record thought. i genuinely think the second half of this record if you just cut those songs and just made it an ep it would be really, really solid. Um, yeah, or, I agree. It would be as good as his first album. Or alternatively, you just made seven more good songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> actually. Like, what the fuck is what? That song is just, like, pointless. And you're yeah. all dead silence because I bet none of you can remember it. it, it that's, yeah, like that's like the that's like the 50 there. second one where he does like one bar and it ends. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that has my favorite bar, and by favorite I mean the worst bar on the album, which is got skunk in my zoot. <laughs> skunk in my zoot. Like, look, I know I'm a fucking white kid from Kentucky, but I know what that means, and it still sounds stupid. Yeah. Fucking skunk in my zoo. No, Doctor Seuss ass bar. Young mums. <laughs> young. Yeah. I personally do want to see a Doctor Seuss book about taking a bad strain of weed and having a horrible <laughs> trip. Young mums drunk. Slow tie too cute. No effort and I do it nonchalant. Bendy Wendy had to doggy that down and I make her bend back like croissant. Caught in the shadows, not a rhyme button. <laughs> 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 what does bend back like croissants even mean? They're it, like it, curls. Croissants what? don't bend back. It doesn't. What? Yeah. Um, this is uh, um, it's fucking. It's an album that I've heard. Uh, it feels undercooked, underdeveloped. That I I honestly have very little to say. Um, I'm sure that I would agree with most of the points that have been raised so far if I could remember a single fucking thing about this album but I can't, so here we are. S uh, slow tie is fucking annoying. Um, and I, I, it works for me on the song on Ginger, just because I think it's fucking hilarious 
and really <laughs> imitatable. How many times um, have we been in the car together and just like said random lines from that stupid fucking oh, verse God. just randomly because and like cackle laughing? Many times. Um, it's the most green yeah. like Tim Fee. It's hysterical, but there's a big old difference between being hysterical for two minutes and being his, not hysterical for 35, um, which <laughs> somehow feels astronomically way too long. Yep. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's annoying and I don't care. This record got a five star from NME and I think that's about all you need to know about it, really. It did? Um, it did. Oh. Well, that says a lot because NME are famously trash. <laughs> I know that Bottom. was one kind of. I, first, I was just like, "Wait, yeah. somebody gave this a 10 and then I was like, "Oh, it's, it's the enemy." enemy. I believe that was the point. But yeah. it's also the kind of thing the enemy would like, irrespective yeah. of how good it is. Um, British. The most succinct way I can talk about this record is the quote from uh, I think Arrested Development, where your man says, um, "Don't, don't like whole ass one thing. Don't half ass two things." Because <laughs> yes. That, that is what this record feels like. In various right. places, it has been listed as a double record, even though it's 35 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, which is sort of the problem in that it's 35 minutes long and you split it down the middle and it's two different records, neither of which feel particularly like, fleshed out. Like, actually, just to build on what I said earlier, if you're, if Solitaire is committed to these two halves being such separate things, mm -hmm. two EPs, do it that way. Yeah, because... that would be really good. Because it's like you can tell this is not as fully formed as the last record. So if you're in that position where you want to get music out, but you don't, I don't know. When you're an artist as big as Slow Tie, your EPs are going to be just as listened to and talked about yeah. as your LP. So I don't see the point in doing this. Trip. No, absolutely. And the thing is, is it's like it's the first half of it, the first track of seven songs. I really don't care for almost at all. I think they have highlights. I think the beat on 45 Smoke is really good. And I think the first verse from Slow Tie is really good. I think the flow in the second half, what was he thinking? Um, but, like, dude, um, you are better than this. You've yeah. proven that you're better than this. Get on the same song. Yes, like, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Um, and then with the song cancelled, I just I need famous people to stop talking about being cancelled when they haven't been. Um, especially like Skeptic Circus, like you're gonna cancel me? I've got twenty awards on the mantelpiece, and, like, and it's like that's, that's so funny to me because I think that it's uh, Skeptic is great. He delivers the hook really well, but it's confusing because like mm -hmm. when has anyone tried to cancel Skeptic? Maybe I exactly. just missed it. Maybe I missed it. It, it makes. It makes you think, like, what are you, what are you hiding? Right. Are you, we, we as a people, have not been able to successfully cancel proven and known rapist Roman Polanski. So it's 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 the same thing where people are just like, oh, you know, talking about being canceled. I'm just like, dude, you are complaining about a bunch of Twitter teens mm -hmm. using a hashtag mm -hmm. for like 12 hours and then considering yeah. yourself canceled. Like, yeah. this, the, the internet's what? memory is a goldfish. Nobody I, fucking yeah. cares. Yeah, and it's so, like, look, like, look, Skepta's flow is there. It's on point. It's really good. But just the whole thing is so inane and it feels like no one knows what they're talking about the on the about, song. The thing about cancellation is that it's a it's it's a thing that happens all the time to people who are not famous yeah exactly like, <laughs> it happens yeah. to people who are twitter famous and then it's revealed that they mm -hmm. groom fucking teenagers or whatever right. that's but what even happens. even it then, doesn't happen to fucking yeah. megastar rappers exactly and I, I don't need megastar rappers to be talking about how cancel culture negatively affects them. I've talked about this guy on the podcast before. Uh, you might've heard of uh, uh, John Ronson did a fantastic book about online shaming called So You've Been Publicly Shamed, yes. um, where he talks about how cancel culture affects the average person who's not famous and who does essentially um, very minor mistakes online and how cancel culture can ruin their lives functionally, but it does not affect famous people. Um, and I need famous people to stop talking about how it affects them because it doesn't. Uh, I think it's particularly funny hearing it talked about in the context of hip hop as well, because that's a, a genre that is built around kind of 
taboo um, yeah. stuff, like and 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 that sort of thing. So it's particularly funny the notion that because that is so normalized in that world, and frankly, mm-hmm. like I don't have an issue with it. Like that's where a lot of the great a lot of the greatest hip hop records uh, contain content that um, today's you. Twitter user would be cancelled for, and that's not a uh, criticism, it's just a fact. Um, but Eminem particularly... drops song where he plays character who locks pregnant girlfriend in car boot and drowns her, cancelled. It's, it's particularly funny to be whining about that when you're in a genre that has, like, been built around the sort of thing, you know, it's like... <laughs> If anyone's not going to be cancelled because their their whole world that they live in is so normalised, it's it's people in the hip hop world. Exactly, like when like Takashi Six Nine and Chris Brown can have hits, you, you're doing yeah, things. fucking exactly. It, yeah. It's like Kevin Kevin Spacey doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. I would say he's the he's been the person most impacted by cancel culture, and by that I mean criminal charges. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But even he still has a he makes a YouTube video every Christmas. Like right. it's not like a fucking Bond villain. The ultimate, yeah. the ultimate, the ultimate example of cancel culture is Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> oh, yeah. He he got so they... canceled. He canceled himself. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. Himself. Yeah, canceled himself. <laughs> Do you think? Do you think we're gonna get a movie about that one day, and then whoever yes. killed oh, him is gonna ab- be like, "You're canceled." Pop, pop. We absolutely <laughs> are. That's gonna and happen. It will be directed by Adam McKay. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, and like, like right before he gets killed, whoever yeah. kills him, pro- presumably like Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and then Joe <laughs> Biden, all all like fused into one person. <laughs> It is gonna like look at the camera Fucking and say American some politician Voltron. Yeah, uh, it's just a bunch of. It's like a bag of wrinkly flesh moving. I can't, you. I can't wait yeah. to have like every major democratic politician in just like a circle going like Triceratops, Tyrannosaur, <laughs> Power Rangers. Yeah, same spirit. I also, no, can can yeah. I can I back up for a moment and say for the listeners of this podcast, despite the fact that we are bitching about um, democratic politicians and cancel culture, we are in fact. Mm-hmm. Not the same people who would often do such a thing. We just yeah. are mad at these things for different reasons. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. Like when I say that, like in the in the minds of people who have that conspiracy theory, is democratic politicians. I'm making fun of the people who hold that belief. Yes. Um, I do not believe it myself. Um, it's the yeah. Republican politicians. Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> how, how fucking boring is this album that we've been rambling about whatever this is we had to talk about jeffrey epstein just to I make things interesting but i i, ha- yeah. I, I, I haven't even talked about more than two songs on the record um mazat has an unbearable hook to me yeah, you have fun with that august um mazat has an unbearable hook and i can't remember the rest of that side album cd mm. yeah um, this too is where it really picks up for me Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Look, so that's what a some people are saying. That's what minutes it is listed as two discs you could, on Wikipedia. You could put I want you to this know album that. on a fucking twelve inch. No, exactly. But it's listed as a double album on Wikipedia. Um, the average, no, the average no, nine inch nails EP is longer than this. Yeah. <laughs> But no, anyway, it's it's the let's say the second side of the twelve inch where this really picks up for me. Um, I love the uh, beat and instrumental on I Tried. It's kind of psychedelic. It reminds me of the title track on the latest Avalanche's album, actually. Um, and it's just a really sort of fun track. Uh, Push, I love the instrumental here as well. Um, and just sort of all, and NHS, um, I'm not a fan of the flow, but it's a really good song. And all over the place, I love this uh, more introspective side of uh, Slow Tie. But again, He's put a lot of effort into the first half and uh, the second half, which is better, suffers because of it. You know, I, I need him to, to um, choose a vibe. and so, Or even like if these songs were interspersed, it would feel more holistic than what this is. At the moment, it's just a poorly paced record that's 35 minutes long. 
Yeah, um, yeah, you're right about that. Um, like, even if you were to intersperse it, it would help the pacing enormously, even if I would feel like it was good track, bad track, good track, bad track, good track, bad track. Um, um, but no, and, and that's sort of it, is um, it's just messy and not very good and not very focused. I mean, it's, it, I won't, it, it's fine. I won't say it's bad, but it's all over the shop. Um, there is no cohesiveness to it. There is no uh, clarity of thought or purpose. There's no holisticness to this record. Um, you can get a couple of... I feel like there is a song here that almost anyone who has a reason to listen to Slow Time in the first place would gravitate to. Um, but that's not really enough to justify a record, really. And I just It's worth saying to Slow Time's credit that the best stuff on the record is the stuff that does things he hasn't done before. Yes. Absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And thank you for pointing it out. Um, yeah, like... But, but, yeah, I will stand by my statement that Feel Away is legitimately a great song. And yeah. I love that track. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, no, Feel Away is really, really good. I won't say a bad word against it. Um, but like, your slow tie, you have done the political things you've done and you drop a track like NHS. I, I want you to dig into that a bit more you know um and this is where it comes down to me is even on the half of the record that i think is that succeeds a lot more evidently hasn't had the fullness of his effort put into this approach and this sort of to flesh out this side to himself because so much of it is going into a half that does absolutely nothing for me um i mean that's an exaggeration i've complimented that side a couple of times but you know um Slow tie must do better next time. Okay, I'll just uh, speed run. I'll speed run through my opinions on this record so we can move on. Only okay. fair that slow tie speed ran through his creating the album. <laughs> Baboom. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is an album of two halves. That's the best and worst part of it. Good in that you can just ignore the first half of uh, pretty mediocre tracks. Uh, and and bad in the sense that there are in fact the first half of mediocre tracks uh yeah we've got uh I i've kind of just throughout this whole thing kind of sprinkled in my opinion of uh just some that uh just kind of some of the features here are good and i think that's kind of a universal thing a lot of the like nine nine times out of ten on this record features are good production sounds consistently adventurous enough it's uh it definitely leaves me uh it, it, it leaves me never bored with just the the sonic approach you got some just really dumb bland kind of braggadocio junk which i think is better explored in the second half under a much more introspective lens uh like particularly a lot of the stuff about dealing drugs i thought the exploration in the second half of that same kind of concept done very differently way better it was way more interesting it, it does show me there's some there's there's certainly still proficiency talent in putting together a lot of this stuff it, it's just that the final product is so desperately fractured and in need of refinement because it just has very little impact. Second half, quite good. Uh, first half, nah. Uh, that's the record, basically. I don't care. I think there has ever been a moment in this podcast where we have ever been more unified in a middling opinion. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I would... I think the album is barely good. I would, I would say yeah. that it, it just edges out from being totally mid to being yeah. good. Yep. No, it's like barely there. One thing I do want to say that I forgot to mention is that I like the way that the last track, ADHD, when it talks about kind of Slow Tide's personality and Slow Tide kind of coming to grips with uh, who he is and how he's understood by the people around him, I think it kind of, kind of loops back nicely and gives a little bit more context for the first half of the record where he's a little bit more kind of boisterous and, and uh, unchained. Um, so I think there's definitely consideration from Slow Tie in terms of how he wants this record to be, to exist as a single project, but it just doesn't come together in that way for us. 
Anyway, let's move on to our favorite, yeah, favorite tracks. Ratings. Uh, Jake. Uh, three favorite tracks. Uh, you know, uh, fucking Feel Away, ADHD, and <laughs> Play With Fire. And least favorite track, fucking what? Uh, and I give it a 5.5, burgeoning on a 6, but no, 5.5. <laughs> So it's August. Yeah. Um, hmm. Favorite <laughs> tracks. Uh, I tried ADHD and uh, Play With Fire. I, I didn't take... I, I don't remember what uh, what track this was from, but if any of you re- remember it, it, it's the track with the, with the bar that's like stacking ammunition, clip it in the stock, cock back on the competition my attack is vicious jack the ripper back in business it, it, whatever song that song went on that that was my least favorite track does anyone love eminem's relapse oh, i was gonna say the way you delivered that was kind of kind of fire mm, kind of well, more fire than it was on the record <laughs> yeah what whatever track that was on i don't fucking remember yeah that, that one's my least favorite why not um okay you say rating? Uh, five point five. Morgan. I don't have favorites or least favorites. It's, uh, who cares? Four and a half out of ten. Valid. Um. I so. <laughs> so my favorites are unsurprisingly all from the back side. Um, and I'm gonna say. Feel away. I tried and uh, push. My least favorite is cancelled because that song is fucking dumb. Um, and I'm going to give this a five. Well, okay. Just as a counterpoint, but also because I do like that song, I'm going to put cancelled in my top three. Um, and I'm, but I'm going to supplement just, it just with... out of spite. <laughs> Not out of spite, really. I do like that song, but also I was like, no one's going to put any song from the first half in their top three. So I'm going to put cancelled. I top did. Three. Did you? Sorry, I missed yeah. that. Yeah. Um, sure. Okay. Well, I'm really not paying attention then. Um, it's fine. We got you in 4K, bitch. <laughs> I'm also going to put, actually, I'm going to put, fuck it, I'm going to put two songs in the first half in my top three just to be chaotic. I'm going to put cancelled, I'm going to put play with fire, and I'm going to put, obviously, my favourite song on the record, which is Feel Away as well. Uh, and I'm going to give it... Yeah, 5.5. <laughs> okay, then. Nice. So that's a standard deviation of 0.4. Jeez. <laughs> uh, and uh, an average rating of 5.2. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what it deserves. Parallels only to A Hero's Death by Fontaine's DC. But for either side, is Trailmaster Replica and Welfare Jazz. God, we, we, we reviewed that Fontaine's DC album. We did. That was something we it heard. Was, it, it was... It was three years ago, I want to say. <laughs> um, I, I, all, yeah, fives, ex- all fives, except for me, and I gave it a seven. You know, I will never listen to that album again. Probably, maybe, if they do another record, I might revisit it. But until the day I die, I will remember <laughs> Televised Mine. <laughs> Te- I, <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say it. I've got Televised Mine. Look, I'll say the first I album is, is the first album is very good, so we should review whatever they make next. Okay, okay. Um, so let's boring. Just let's move. On the week. Mm. Let's move. <laughs> Tyler has to fucking reset. <laughs> you guys start on it. Tyler, I'm gonna. Tron. I'm gonna. Let's, I'm gonna. Let's. I, let's. I, I let's move on. But... Stopped working. Please reboot. <laughs> So now it's time to talk about our second record that we're going to review today, which is um, the another sophomore album, funnily enough, um, from uh, Hayley Williams of Paramore fame, uh, the follow-up to her um, debut solo record, Pedals for Armor, which came out last year. We have uh, its sister album, I suppose, although to be quite honest, if it went for the similarities in title, uh, I would not have considered no. the two records related at all, but anyway she's, she's called it a prequel what interesting i don't know i don't know what the fuck that means really but anyway you know. it's called the album whatever called you flowers. say colorful mommy the hour is called flowers for vases vases um slash day <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And uh, I will let uh, whoever wants to introduce this and talk about it first. Of course. Well, it's a, uh, it's the it's a Haley Williams record. It's just, she doesn't need an introduction. You know who she is. If you don't, where have you been? Um, she's like interestingly enough, just her alone has re reached like a sort of pop idol status but like by way of being in a rock band i don't know it's, <laughs> it's very interesting the way the public perceives her um yeah it's her follow-up album from the very stylistically scattershot uh pedals for armor um and this is much less stylistically scattershot i would say perhaps too far in the other direction at some points but I'll just go ahead and get right into it. I I like this record quite a bit, as I probably made apparent in the Discord earlier. Um, I definitely think it gets off to a bit of a rocky start. Um, the all right, Tyler, are you making faces? Sorry, it's just the first song was my favorite on the record. <laughs> I, I I'm going to take a bet and say that Morgan might have been referring to my limb and not first thing to go. Yeah, I think I think. I do like first thing to go, uh, but the my limb and a a, a systole is the, yeah that's it those two uh, no little n no the um, hook on my limb is just a what's the word bad an annoying <laughs> is the word um, bad. correct yeah. both yeah yeah it's rough for a little bit there but once the album finds its focus a little more. And it leans into the folkier side of things, which I think is a look she wears quite well and would certainly be something I am interested in seeing her develop as time goes on, because that's what this album needs is a little more development. Um, I th anyway, I think the songs here, the ones that are really uh, properly fleshed out ideas, minimal as they are, are uh, really excellent i would say and i think the sort of minimalistic but almost um it's it's certainly nowhere near as intricate as the production on something like punisher but i would i would say it's a similar approach in the way that it takes simple folk songs and sort of builds soundscapes around them um i really appreciate that a lot on songs like uh uh, how you doing comes to mind just uh written as h y d um <laughs> i find the fucking <laughs> the first second of that where it includes a demo she was trying to take as a plane yeah. was going yeah, over yeah. that was really she's like fucking kidding, fucking, me? Kidding me? fucking kidding me <laughs> which i mean hashtag Dude. mood it has the same um, energy as let's do that again but this time good <laughs> yeah. Yeah. or it's yeah, it's like that bit. fucking brockhampton verse where fucking uh matt champion just messes up in the middle of it and he just goes that fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah i think a lot of these songs end up falling on the back half uh mm. starting with good grief is where it really picks up i think um, Keep You Right Here is another great one. In Ordinary is one she's talked about some in interviews as a particular highlight from her perspective, and I would have to agree. But I think overall my feeling is that it's really good, and I will come back to a handful of songs, probably about half of it in total. But even those parts just need more. I would have liked to have seen this be a 2022 release. Um and just had more time in the oven, uh, perhaps even give some of the songs a rewrite, particularly ones on the front half. You know, I know Haley's really proud of the fact that she uh, played every instrument on the record and recorded it herself, but it does show its limitations in that aspect, particularly in the more involved songs, I think, like mm -hmm. uh, My Limb, it just kind of, I don't know, it, it, it feels a little stilted in places where she's playing instruments she's not necessarily super familiar with. Um, or maybe she is, I don't know. But it feels stilted. 
um, in places. So yeah, I would have liked to have seen this have the sort of same full band treatment as uh, Pedals for Armor, um, because I do think this is definitely an improvement on that album, but it's also, it still feels like it needs more. Um, that's essentially my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a good way of putting. I, I, you know, it's funny that like we 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 had a mild disagreement in the uh, Discord <laughs> just over regarding this album, which is funny just because I, I broadly feel exactly the same, even though I, I just think that I enjoy the the highlights maybe a tiny bit less. I think that like, if anything, this stands testament to um, the idea that. Uh, if you ever concerned just like, well, Jake just really likes to listen to those singer songwriter records for people he likes. They could release anything and he would love it. And it's like, well, um, uh, hate to disappoint you here, but this is not that I, I am far more mixed on this than I would have liked to be because I love Haley Williams, love her work. Uh, and this approach is an approach that should have knocked it out of the park with me specifically. I am the target audience. And it's just like, yeah, again, this is, it, it's so strange that we covered such disparate albums this week that have like the exact same problem, being that they're both a little bit undercooked and both have kind of a limp first half. And like, I admire a lot of what she's doing. And I think that the consistent thing that holds this all together to being a positive experience is that I do think that Haley's songwriting is very, very good. Um, she she's always sort of like as Paramore has sort of continued I've always found her pen game or the band's pen game to be uh, consistently fairly I, I said it Stop cheekily it don't fucking fucking come after me bitch but um it, it, it's it's as they go on they they reflect a certain amount of maturity uh in their content as they go along and it's it's refreshing when you actually like go back and visit their albums uh, and it, you could sort of see that reflected in pedals for armor which i broadly agree with as well as that i just think that project is really really long and really all over the place it's like none of it's bad it's just like Ah, uh, I really wish that this put like if you Tyler, squeeze that stupid fucking look off your face <laughs> if you squeeze what was the great parts of that album and the great parts of this album together you're not going to have something stylistically cohesive but you would have an <laughs> album that is at least consistently very good um it, it's really like it, down to the exact song is like good grief is sort of when the album sort of picks up i think that the first five tracks are a bit like i don't know i was waiting for a song that was something more like simmer on the last album that was just sort of something that was like a unique combination that had interesting sound play that like grabbed me in the way that, that song did it's like not something that i immediately loved but it was something that i sort of uh, grew to really like just because of how different and interesting it was. Uh, it was it was a good look for her, and I I don't know th this this album is is frustrating in many ways because it's like the parts of it that I remember are pretty damn great, and then the things that I don't remember are they have vanished, they've evaporated. And again, if this were an EP of the be of the uh, artist in question here's best moments, it would be a rockin' fucking EP. That said, it's got like almost half of it is just kind of like, ah, this feels very underdeveloped. This, you know, Morgan brought up the Punisher comparison and I think that's basically perfect. And that it's just, both are very, they're trying to achieve the same sort of blend and the same kind of sonic aesthetic. And I think that maybe Phoebe's more strict adherence to staying in her particular genre lane has cultivated a uh, environment in which she can make something like that and have it feel very natural. Whereas Haley is clearly in this stage in her career experimenting and wanting to venture beyond the, I won't say limitations of Paramore, but the limitations that one encounters when you are in fact in a band like Paramore. It's like, you can't make songs like Simmer. You can't make mm. songs like In Ordinary. You can't make songs like uh, Just the Lover. It, it's it's different and I respect it. It's just that I, mean, I want you, her you to- You say that, but like at the time where, before Paramore took their hiatus, I would have said they could never make uh, a song like uh, the Bidoo Bada, um, 
like fake happy or rose colored boy or uh some I, I get shit on what love. you mean from an aesthetic principle but those are still pop songs like the things yeah. that she's doing on these two albums are like the literal fucking antithesis it's like these songs often don't have structure some of them don't have hooks and that's fine mm -hmm. sometimes but other times it feels a bit like flailing and it's just like ah, i know that this is like it, it almost feels like not only is this sort of solo stuff sort of her trying to course correct for her identity as an artist but like also the fact that this album sort of seems to have the opposite problem as pedals for armor it's just like this is a course correct within a course correct that was already kind of on shaky grounds so it's like yeah morgan pretty much hit the nail on the head is that this is this would have been an album that would be great in eight months as it is it is just kind of mixed yeah, I mean, look, I, I know I quibbled with some finer points, but I do broadly agree with what both of you are saying. Most of these songs, I think, are really emotionally coherent and affecting and well-written. That being said, boy, does my limb stop the momentum of this album right in its tracks on the second song. Because um, that is a song in which I find the chorus boring. I find the instrumentation boring. And um, I just generally find the theme is so unexplored. Um, but something like A Sisterly, um, which I always hear sounding like, hey, Sister Lee, um, which I actually think tells the story much better, or something like Trigger, which comes immediately afterwards. Are two of my personal highlights on the record. I have to quote with Morgan. I'm not a big fan of Good Grief. I just find that song slightly trite, I guess. Um, but Wait On, An Ordinary, HYD, um, wonderful singer-songwriter tracks um, and then the closer just a lover um, blossoms into this sort of fuzzy noisy slow build of a rock track that really closes out in a wonderful way um, but in general especially with that sort of milk toast cover art this feels much more like um, a record you make for yourself and keep to yourself that you made because you wanted to and that's fine um, but this isn't up to the level of what I would want a commercial release from Hayley Williams to be. I think so also to an extent, maybe the reason that it is out so in such a form that maybe people feel like it could have been more developed is because hayley has been vocal about wanting to um, start working on the next Paramore record. So mm -hmm. um, perhaps this was just something that she wanted to get out of her system R yeah, no, rather absolutely. than rather than some yeah. kind of grand statement she was trying to make, it seems more like um, an experiment. Yeah, and I know a lot of other musical acts who did similar things in lockdown, including um, uh, the Matt and Goat album songs of Pierre Chauvin. That's exactly what that was. Um, was Here we go. Getting it is the Mountain Goats. Someone but ding, 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 ding. I wouldn't, but it's a perfect comparison because no, um, I, I definitely see it. Getting Into Knives was already recorded, but they didn't want to release it. So John did another boombox record in his bedroom. Um, and it, that's an album that suffers from a similar problem of people haven't looked at these songs and said, John, they're not written enough. Um, and yeah, that, that is sort of the problem for this and that it feels like uh, Hayley Williams sort of indulgence. I want to make a record in lockdown because what else am I going to do? I'm a songwriter. Actually, the perfect example for me is the last Laura Jane Gross solo record, um, Stay Alive, in that it feels like Laura had a lot of songs that were going to go on the next Against Me record, but couldn't make a record with them. So just recorded them herself and they weren't finished. Um, and I like that record and I like this record. They both have really great standout tracks but there's just something not there about both of those records. Yeah. Um, I, I think it, it's, uh, I, I, I'm about, sorry. I think it's fair to say that we would not be talking about this record, even if it were the exact same album, if it were not by Hayley Williams. Mm -hmm. yes. um, yeah. But I yeah. want to go last on this um, so as not to okay, upstage August again. Um, 
Um, um, so another speed run review for you. Yeah, August can come in here with that. Def- I mean, we all saw this coming. August would have, was, of course, going to be the one who loved this the most. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, this this album uh, evokes such uh, such classics as uh, uh, fucking the Holy Mountain and Clifford the Big Red Dog. Uh, it's a really <laughs> fantastic project. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it should be set out this of the game. The, this is the live action Clifford to, puni- to, to Punisher's cartoon Clifford or whatever. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it should be said, of course, this is not my thing. I mean, I, I do think there's a song or two on here that's that's catchy enough. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, I thought my limb wasn't half bad. Uh, I thought that I particularly got into a bit of the uh, verses there. I thought those were all right. Uh, uh, and the chorus I don't find as grating as everyone else, but it's not exactly something I defend as creative particularly. Uh, you know, she's got a nice enough voice to, to carry the record and a decent enough production across the whole thing, but uh, it's, it's 42 minutes and 14 tracks that are more often than not uh criminally underwritten really yeah, did you say I, let me st- let me stop you right there did you say she has a nice enough voice <laughs> <laughs> i think she's got a nice enough voice i didn't dislike it is that a fuck <laughs> just i i'm on my, i'm gonna figuratively on my knees begging you to listen to brand new <laughs> eyes yeah really he is going to give that album a six. What are you talking about? No, may, maybe, <laughs> but at the very least, this, that, this is not against you, August. Look, it, it like, really isn't. I, <laughs> I, actually just think, saying. I actually think Morgan, uh, sorry, August has a much better chance of appreciating post revival Paramore. Yeah, but Perhaps. I don't think that I don't think that uh, after Laughter, for instance, would give August a really thorough sense of of their identity as a band. I I always look, I think look none of none of just none of this matters. My point was that is Aretha Franklin nice enough? <laughs> is it, is it, Come on, Morgan. That's, that's a step too far. Does, does Whitney Houston sound pretty decent? <laughs> yes, she does, actually. God, you're Haley Haley Williams is no Whitney Houston. And I love Haley Williams' voice, but I... Let's be real here. Oh God, it's, it's I'm like, making a point. Stop being like, a I, cunt. I, I, I make it. I fucking co- can compliment. I, I can give a compliment, and and you take it as me ravishing <laughs> Haley Williams. It's not a compliment. I would personally like I to said you're massively nice underselling, underselling it. it. <laughs> Why Haley Williams being the one to break this podcast apart aye, was aye. not a plot twist I had on my bingo card for just, 2021. Aye, aye. <laughs> August saying you take like a ravishing Haley Williams is just I gotta need a moment. I, I, I'd like to ravish Haley Williams. What? I said that, but they're I think, all talking. <laughs> anyway, August, continue with what you were saying. No, no, I think I'm fine. I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, good. I, shut up. No, no, fine. <laughs> Fuck you. I'm gonna finish my review, buddy. Uh, yeah, some of the verses. I think verses. About half of the time are skeletal uh, choruses, a bit underwritten. Uh, there, there's like enough exceptions that I'm never particularly, particularly like completely detached from this. But is I there think anything you'd say just... was the only exception? Hmm. I'm gonna come to yes. London and fucking kill you. <laughs> move, move on. He doesn't know what that means. Just move on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, it makes me wish I gave Punisher a higher rating. That's all. Oh, that was good to hear. That was vindication right there, baby. You're a cunt. All right, so... um, I love Paramore. I I need to establish that uh, before I get into this. I I love Paramore. I'm not... I can't pretend to be like the, the, the colossal Paramore fan that, for instance, Morgan and Saoirse are. Um, but I do love them. I think they have not had a single miss in their discography to date. Um, 
I even think my favorite Paramore album is the most excessive and baggy one, which is the self-titled one. I just, I can still, despite the fact that that record is long, much longer than it needs to be, I can still comfortably listen to it from start to finish. And I was yeah, fully on board. Bones. I was fully on board for their kind of, I wouldn't call it that big of a radical change because they've always been a pop band, but the shift they took um, with After Laughter, I thought was really smart and resulted in a really strong record. Um, and I like Hayley Williams as a personality as well as as a singer. I think that she's really funny. She writes really incisively in Paramore. Um, her, um, she's has an indelible talent for pop punk hooks and obviously not just pop punk hooks because, you know, After Laughter exists. Um, you know, she's great. Um, she's a fantastic front woman. She's um, got so much charisma and energy. Um, and so, yeah, I, I checked out um, Pedals for, I keep wanting to call it Pedals for Vases, Pedals for Armour um, uh, a few days ago. Uh, and I did not like that album. Uh, I'm sorry to say. Uh, it felt like it was not channeling, with the exception of Simmer, which I liked a lot, it was a great song. It felt like that record was not channeling any of her strengths as a songwriter or as a performer. Uh, and in fact, in many instances was actively going against it. And I point to songs on that record like um, Creepin, which is God awful, Dead Horse, um, Sugar on the Rim, Watch Me While I Bloom, some really just terrible songs on that record. Um, and I hate saying that because I, I, I was actually quite- I hate quite, you saying it too. I know you do. And I'm, I'm doing, I'm giving you the respect of being perfectly honest about my feelings. Um, and so, but at least I approached um, Flowers for Vases. the respect of pooping on your doorstep. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fair. Oh my I, God, shut the fuck up, dude. <laughs> And look, fight, 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 fight. <laughs> and look, I, I had heard that Flowers for Vases was a stylistic shift from Pedals for Armor. Um, and so I was intrigued. And lo and behold, it very much is. This is not a record that sounds remotely like that previous record, except for the fact that um, it's got a similarly kind of polished pop sheen in the production department and sort of uh and another similarity is that um Hayley is kind of flailing for hooks on both records I think um but yeah this didn't really do it for me I definitely think this is a, a better record than Pedals for Armor purely by virtue of being more um stylistically unified and unlike that record having no moments I would call out right bad uh, even my limb, I think that hook is atrocious, but the rest of the song, I would agree with August, is actually pretty solid. It's fine, um, uh, and and so and so Punisher has been brought up as a reference point for the sort of sound that Haley's going for on this record. But I think a much more accurate reflection of what she's trying to do uh, that I and I believe a, a reference point that she made herself is Taylor Swift's folklore. Um, I see the two records as very similar um, and the difference is essentially just the personalities of um, the two songwriters um, and I did write down my thoughts um, so yeah the biggest problem with um, Pedals for Armour was that it was bloated as all hell it was too long uh, it was stretched thin with ideas that were not good in the first place and part of that was due to the fact that that record was originally a series of EPs that I believe uh, her label yeah. convinced her to package together as a record. And when learning that, I kind of appreciate a little bit more the fact that um, perhaps that wasn't necessarily her vision for how those songs were to be presented. But but still, it made it, um, it definitely dragged down the experience of that record. This album is 15 minutes shorter than Pedals for Armor, but it has almost the same number of tracks. And I kind of think that sort of gives you an idea of where Haley's at with her album construction skills as a solo artist so far, which is to say, not quite there yet. Um, I do think this is Haley's attempt to do a folklore, a 
a quarantine record where she strips down all of her musical ambitions to simple guitar and vocal arrangements, really calls attention to her voice, which I will say sounds great on this record. Um, absolutely no qualms with her vocal performances. Um, uh, and her writing is um, anonymous, I'll say. Um, but the, and the issue is uh, that folklore works to the extent that it does. And obviously we've debated the extent to which it does work, um, but it works to the extent that it does because it's a subversion of a certain expectation that people had for Taylor. She had built up this colossal pop empire from modest country and folk music roots, and then abruptly returned to something approximating those roots, but with the high end production style one would expect from a huge star at this point. And um, the issue with Haley attempting to do that here uh, is that she doesn't really have the same set of expectations to subvert. Um, Pudels was a, such a mixed bag of a record, but if it did one thing, it was make clear that Haley had no interest in pursuing pop punk in her solo career. In a sense, that record is kind of, if misguided, but still a continuation of, of After Laughter, though with none of that record's charm or quality hooks. But Flowers exists in no such space. It doesn't demonstrate any new skill of Haley's, uh, as these songs are crisply produced, but unremarkable. Uh, it lead, leans into none of her strengths, um, except maybe her strength as a vocalist, which again, she sounds good, but not as vocally commanding as I would have liked, uh, or maybe even expected. Um, and if anything, I think this record just does demonstrates more of her limits um, in the same way that Pedals did, except this time her limits are with regard to folk music. Um, if folklore's writing could easily lapse into the worst, corniest cliche tendencies of Taylor Swift's pop music, highlighting the dissonance between the writing and the style in that new sound of hers, then Flower's writing is better at least um, by virtue of being not terrible. Um, and, and, and liking Paramore as much as I do and, and Haley as a personality just makes the experience of this record all the more frustrating for me. But at the same time, I don't take it too seriously because it does feel like it is Haley trying a new sound, trying to expand her um, capabilities and her range as a musician. Uh, and I think that she should be commended for trying to do that. Um, it's, I respect that with both of her solo records so far, Haley has tried to do things that she hasn't done before, uh, even if they don't really come off for me. Um, I, I do think though, I do wonder um, across both this record and the last one, what has happened to Haley's ability to write really great hooks um, because it wasn't just the fact that Paramore was an urgent and driving, or is an urgent and driving and loud band that makes those songs great. It's how good Haley is at getting writing hooks that stick in your brain and and anchoring a really compelling song around them. And uh, Flowers for Vases feels kind of listless and um, unmemorable. I did listen to it twice, um, and I, I kind of really struggled to come away with um, much to say about the actual music itself but I can't call this a bad record it's not a bad record it's just not something that grabs me really I, I think the first song is kind of a nice um, tone setter it's definitely the, my favorite on the record it, it, it really took me aback when I first played the album and that first song came on because it wasn't what I was expecting um, but it felt like it was setting up a foundation that Haley was going to build on um, and just kind of didn't. And I, yeah, I wish I liked it more, but um, yeah, it just didn't really come together for me. Uh, yeah. My three favorite tracks on this record, if I had to pick three, um, well, definitely the first song, First Thing to Go. Uh, I would also say I thought that Over Those Hills was not bad. Uh, and I'll also chuck in In Ordinary as well. Uh, least favorite track, um, again, I don't think there's a single thing on this record that stands out as particularly bad, um, but I thought that uh, No Use I Just Do was kind of particularly 
pointless. So I'll, I'll, I'll guess I'll pick that one. Uh, and I'm giving the record uh, five out of 10. Fair enough, dude. Um, so my favorite tracks were, excuse me, Sicily, uh, Trigger, and um, Just a Lover. My least favorite was My Limb, and I'm giving this record a six. Favorite was My Limb. Uh, least favorite, don't really have one. I don't know, five out of 10. Okay, uh, Jack Thinney. Uh Three favorite tracks, Good Grief, In Ordinary, and Just a Lover, least favorite limbs, uh, six out of ten. Uh, neat. So that just leads Morgan. Oh, uh, say good grief, find me here, and keep you right here, and least favorite, a systole, and a seven and a half. Okay, right. So that gives us an average of uh, 5.9, which lines up with um none of our albums <laughs> uh but the albums we have at six are how i'm feeling now uh damn the weeds where the world once was marshall mathers two hardwired to self-destruct what a fucking eclectic i know right of <laughs> and also just my nice. opinions on the record was just like going up and down with each one i read out bright eyes and the marshall was... mathers lp2 <laughs> <laughs> not even funny how much better how i'm feeling now is better than all it's, of those records uh, it's in it's in company. Yeah. Um, it's in okay. some company. Yeah, well, some. That and that uh, brings us to the end of our new release reviews. Um, next week we're going to be uh, reviewing some interesting records. Uh, we're going to be t- talking about the new surprise drop Black Dresses album, which I suspect will be Yo. a really interesting, really interesting discussion. And we're going to be talking about, um, of course, legendary post rock stalwarts. Mogwai with their 10th studio record As the Love Continues. Um, but before then, uh, the first thing you need to do if you're watching is go and watch our Record Club video on Brockhampton's Iridescence, uh, which is uh, going to be a thing that we do. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. What will also um, be a thing that we do is next week's Record Club. Oh, yeah, and next week's Record yeah, Club. Boy. <laughs> next week's Record Club. Is gonna, oh is going to be um, Philosophy of the World by the Shags. Oh, um, and all so. I'm going to say is that I if the Shags album, if the Shags album has a higher average than the Black Dresses album next week, I may become homicidal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I thought you were about to say I may become homosexual. And I'm like, Tyler, I have bad news for you. Oh, no, I, I, I am become homosexual. Don't worry. <laughs> Destroyer of worlds. This is like it's just like the uh, the Joker meme where it's like I will become the homosexual. I am yeah. become homosexual. Destroyer of anuses. <laughs> Look upon my works, ye mighty in despair. I, I don't think I will. Anyway, um, yeah, that's it for this week. Rock over London. Rock on Rock Chicago. On Chicago. Pesco, everyone, every hell, every, oh, fuck.